I was looping him into my progress and he's like, you know what? Like, what if I just send you five bikes? And I was like, what do you mean just send me five bikes? That's like 12 grand. I don't have that money. And he's like, just get launched, just do this. Don't worry about it. They showed up at my house on a freight truck. I didn't even pay for shipping. This guy sent me five bikes to my home across the country. And I was like, wow, okay. So yeah, this is happening. Welcome to Seacoast Stories, a podcast about the people, businesses, and newsmakers that make the Seacoast an American hidden gem. I'm Trey Parkas, and on today's episode, how a combination of soul searching and dumb luck led Katie Marshall to open Dover's first indoor cycling studio. Here's something I learned recently. In the early 1800s, a British man called William Cubitt invented the treadmill. It was not used for exercise, however, but rather as punishment for prisoners. In other words, it was a form of torture. So if running on a treadmill feels like torture for you, then your feelings are validated. Running with nowhere to go in a smelly gym with fluorescent lighting? I can't imagine much worse. The stationary bike is slightly better, but it still sucks. That's why you have to make it fun. And what makes everything more fun, you ask? Well, dimming the lights, loud music, and dancing like there's no one else in the room. Hence, the indoor cycling studio. This craze started in 2006, with name brand SoulCycle leading the way. Boutique spin classes started popping up all over the world, and everyone and their mother, no, literally, like, mothers love this stuff, got addicted to dancing on a bike in a room full of people. I am a fake enthusiast. I ride the Peloton once per week, but I find that even the solo virtual ride is a very fun time. It's even therapeutic, and it's just a great way to burn some calories. In 2021, the global indoor cycling market was valued at $1.5 billion. And in 2030, it's expected to almost double, reaching $2.8 billion. The craze is only getting crazier. And that is great news for today's guest, Katie Marshall. She owns Studio One Cycling in Dover, New Hampshire. It's the top studio in town, and those who attend are obsessed with it. As for the Seaco story behind the studio, it starts in Elliott, Maine, and you'll just have to hear it to believe it. Elliot is, it's a small town. It's a simple upbringing, I would say. It's located in an amazing spot. I've always loved that being near the seacoast, um, having access to whether you want to go to Boston, it's an hour away. You want to go to Portland, Maine, it's an hour north, kind of in the middle ground, but always having access to what you need. And, you know, I think living in this area being a small town, there's a lot of potential to build communities and to connect with each other. And I think I've always felt that, but I will summarize it as just being a simple place to live and to grow up. Did you have an appreciation for it while you were growing up? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't. I can't say that I did. I think as I grew up, I was just so I was a soccer player and I loved that. And I just tried to focus and pursue that throughout my upbringing. But I wasn't recognizing what was going on around me or where I was located. And that's always something I think when I look back as I get older, I realize like, man, I really should have capitalized on that or recognized that or showed more gratitude. And I think as I get older, that's what I'm trying to practice more of. And now having since moved away, I think there is some effect of the seacoast that's kind of like a boomerang effect. Like you grow up here and you're like, I got to get out. And then you decide like, okay, it's time to go back home. You know, there's something special about it. And I've always loved the vibe of the people around here. And I found a lot of really beautiful connections as far as my close people go. So it's been good. Why did you want to get out as fast <laughs> as possible? That's uh, a more complicated answer. I think it's a lot of internal reasons more than external. But at that point in my life, just that idea of feeling lost. And I think a tendency of mine is to run away from things that are uncomfortable, right? Like that's something I've recognized over time and uh, feeling as though there was this intense 
pressure of having an identity as one person, whether that is as simple as playing soccer your whole life. I kind of, that was where I thrived. That's where I felt confident. That's where I loved what I did. Um, once I played through college and that was done, I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? I don't have this thing that brings me joy. I don't have the team camaraderie. I don't have that connection anymore. So after college, I was just really lost and disconnected to this place. And I felt like living at home and my family's incredible and I love them. I do. It's just being at that age where you're trying to become yourself, but you're still in your small town. So I needed to move. So at some point, you realized that you would not become a professional soccer player. You did end up playing four years of D3, but once you wrapped up your college years, what was the plan? There wasn't one. <laughs> no, it, it, there wasn't, to be truthful. I went to school for athletic training with the intent of becoming a physical therapist. And I think college is so funny because we're expected to know what we want to do at 17 or 16 years old and just pick something and do it, um, which is exactly what I did because I experienced having injured myself, gone through PT and be like, oh my gosh, this is a great way to work with athletes or to help people get better and feel better and do what they want to do again, right? Like that's kind of the thought process around that profession. And I had a great experience. I was like, this would be cool because it can tie in my worlds of like athletics and be something that I can help people with. Right. So that is what the plan was. And then I got to athletic training school and I didn't want to be that. I know I didn't want to be an AT because if I wanted to become an athletic trainer, I really would want to be at a high level of athletics. And to get there, you have to go through everything I didn't want to commit my life to. And that's just not, that wasn't it for me. It wasn't speaking to me. So that's when I left uh, Maine and I moved out to Seattle. I've always been someone who worked in the service industry, like cafes, smoothie bars, restaurants, things like that. So I was like, I'll just figure it out and get a job out there. My sister lived out there at the time. So there was that connection. Um, you went without? Without a plan. Love yeah, that. No plan. Why Seattle specifically? Because, because, because sister? my sister, I think okay. there was one safety net there for me that was like, okay, I can get out and at least I know someone, <laughs> you know, like I know that. So that's what pulled me because I didn't have a direction. I was completely just like flailing around trying to figure out where I wanted to land. And so I got a barista job in Seattle and like one of the busiest cafes in Pioneer Square, which was awesome, but it was not fulfilling in a purpose driven way, right? Like that's kind of where I found myself for years and years and years was doing things just to make ends meet, but not because of my purpose. And so that ran its course. I got another job at a co-working space, which was much more impactful in the sense of it was a community that was very socially conscious. Um, but at the end of the day, I didn't have enough money. I was like, I'm broke. I got to move back home. Like this is what it has to be. And that wasn't a decision that I made with my heart other than it was just out of survival. Like I had to come back here because I had to survive. I had to live with my parents for a little bit. So that's kind of where the fitness journey started was when I moved back. You had finished up playing college soccer. So what did your relationship to fitness look like in the years after that once you lose that huge part of your identity? It wasn't pretty at all. I'll be the first person to tell you I don't love fitness, which is ironic. <laughs> um... But I think that's what makes this and my business now relatable to the average person. Because yes, I was an athlete. I had a purpose when I was working out. I had practice after school every day. I had preseason to get ready for. I had these things that kept me in the game, right? So when all of that dropped away, the self-accountability was not there. And I don't love running. I don't. I want to. <laughs> so much of me wants to, to love that. That would be much easier, but I don't. So there's resistance there. Um, and I wasn't, I was always someone who just would go into a gym with my hood on and like have my earbuds in, not talk to anybody, just do what I had to do, lift some weights and then get out of there. I wasn't connecting with people. I was definitely not going to group fitness classes. I didn't have a routine. I didn't have accountability. And I felt, to be honest with you, I was very depressed at that point in my life. So just super disconnected to any of that power that I felt like on the soccer field, for example, or being a leader on the field. Why were you so depressed? The way I see it, when I'm struggling in that kind of emotional dark place, if you will, it's normally showing me something, right? It's leading me down like, okay, I need to explore this. And that's kind of when in my 20s, 
I knew that something wasn't right because you could look at my life and be like, you have a loving family, you have a beautiful place to live, you have a job, you have a roof over your head, right? Like I had everything I needed, but I didn't feel good inside. There was something missing there. If I'm not doing something that's making an impact, I feel worthless, which is tough. If I'm just working at a cafe, it's not enough for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though I could brighten someone's day with a beautiful latte and like say their name and have a great interaction. That's just not the impact I'm trying to make. So it turns into a point of like, okay, I feel like I don't even know. I don't have the thing that I loved anymore. I'm not even showing up for myself in the ways that I know I should be, but I'm not actually doing it. So there's like some resistance there. And that's when like the self-discovery started to happen. It was a very, it's a very slow, it's always a slow process, but I knew that these feelings needed to be addressed. And I think so much of that was the abrupt halt of my entire life was dedicated to athletics and sports and this life that is done now. And my career wasn't distracting me. It's not like I had this career path that was like pulling me along. And I was kind of just trying to be and that felt really uncomfortable because I didn't have anything that I could connect to an identity or a story or a purpose or a reason. Right. So that's where I think it came from was this feeling of just being lost. What did this process of self-awareness and self-discovery and realizing all these things about yourself, what did that look like? So I moved back and I was like, I need people to help me. I needed support. I needed accountability, but I needed to be in an environment that fosters that. And so that's kind of where I was like, I don't have a plan, but I know the type of feeling I want to have or the type of space I want to be in. And that's a health centric space because I need that support. I was looking around for jobs and that's when I got a job at a studio in Portsmouth as a front desk person. I just applied there. It was a boutique studio and I applied there just to work to be in a health centric place because I needed help. <laughs> and so that's where I kind of fell into group fitness because like I said before, I never took group classes. I avoided that. I wanted to be hidden. I wanted to be in the back. I didn't want to be seen, period, especially if I'm struggling internally. I'm not trying to put myself out there. So that's kind of when I fell into the fitness space. And so that started the self-discovery in a way of showing up for myself in a new way and feeling feeling okay in my body, doing different things, and in a community that I felt safe enough to explore. Can you take me back to the day that you took that first cycling class? And what do you remember about it? I remember walking out at the end and saying, what the fuck was that? <laughs> I was like, what just happened to me? I didn't get it at all before I took that class. And then being someone who is an athlete by nature and very musically driven, like I love music. It's a part of my family. And so having rhythm and wanting to dance and those types of things. When I took that class, I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but I love this. Like this is hitting all of my senses. This is giving me a community aspect. It's moving my body. It's driven to music. So it's like dancing on a bike. And there's this emotional intensity to it. That's like this layer underneath that you don't expect because that's the magic of music. If you're really using it as a tool, it can get inside people's emotions and in their body and move energy around. And so I felt this like palpable energy, whether I was doing it right or not, didn't matter. I was in it. And that's what I remember feeling was like, I felt like I blacked out. Like my first class was just so overwhelming for so many reasons, but in the best way for me. And it was everything I needed at that time. And I remember that feeling of just being like, what the fuck was that? I want more. I knew I wanted more of it. And so what did more look like for you? So at the time, I was just working behind the desk as like a studio manager, if you will. And then once I started taking those classes naturally, I became addicted to it. And I was taking three classes a day because I was like, I just can't get enough of this. And I wanted to be good. Like I wanted to be in the front. I wanted to be on beat. I wanted to know all the choreography. Like I, I was like, oh, okay, Katie, this is your new thing. Like, this is it. This is what you needed. And so I took it and I ran with it. But I will say I never thought I would be an instructor. That was never a part of my plan ever. I was like, no, no, I'm good on this side of things. Like I just want to be, I love riding. But at the time they knew there was an instructor training and I said, hell no, 
was like, there's no way I'm putting a microphone on with bright lights. No way. Why would I do that? <laughs> like, that's not what I want. So I had the right person at the right moment say to me, why not try it? It was just like the simplest thing ever, but it hit me at that time to be like, all right, I should just try it. I should just try it. But I skipped the first session because I really didn't want to go. <laughs> and it was after that she was like, why not try right now? I was like, you're right. And so it was just the nudge that I needed to do it. And then I was the only person who made it through the training group. And once I put a microphone on and I started speaking and leading to the music and all of that felt so right. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy, but I think I'm supposed to do this. So you went on to teach at other studios around the country, right? Yes, I would say only taught at one. I would ride at a bunch. So I taught for Soul Cycle after that. But I had been living in Nashville. I went to a studio there as a rider, really wanted to teach there. The timing wasn't right. I love that community so much. It was my safe space when I moved there because, again, I was in this lost place of just wanting to teach, not knowing where. But the Seacoast, I couldn't be here anymore because I walked away from my role as an instructor here in Portsmouth. And I was like, I can't be here anymore. I, I don't know who I am again, right? It's always coming back to this. Oh, like, wow, I don't okay. feel like I had so much of my identity wrapped up into that, which is wild now. But looking back, that's exactly how I felt was like, I was an instructor. I had impact. I had community. I had all this. And then I left and I didn't know where else to go. But what ended up happening was I applied at SoulCycle while I was in Nashville because they had auditions two weeks later when I looked from when I looked it up in Atlanta. So it was coming up really fast. Like when I decided, I was like, oh, maybe SoulCycle is exactly what I need because it could be a full-time job. When before I was like, no, they're corporate, like all these thoughts against SoulCycle. And then the point in my life where I was like, wait, I want to do this and I want security. Like that kind of makes sense. So I looked up their website and then they happened to have auditions two weeks later. And so that's when the forces came in, like my best friend, my family, they were like, you're doing this. Like you're doing this. They helped me get all my like application and everything set and ready. And they ended up accepting me to the audition. And then from that moment forward, they accepted me to the training program. And then they sent me to California to teach. So that's where I went. So that training was in New York City. And that's where you really learn. That's where I learned how to become an instructor. Like this is how you command a room. This is how you perform, yada, yada. Like so much good stuff came out of that training because it was so challenging emotionally. And they put you through it. So that's when California came into the picture. And I taught out there. At Soul Cycle in California for how long? Just six months because the pandemic hit six months in. So I got furloughed at the time because I was a new instructor. So most people just lost their job. And obviously I had so much time to just be like, I was going for walks every day. It was really lovely, <laughs> like really not tied to anything. Because in California, was, too. California, it's not <laughs> bad. Right. But the thing was, I was pouring my heart and soul right into this as we do. And it wasn't until I stepped out of it where again, I hit this checkpoint where I was like, something's not right. I actually don't want to go back. Like as they were starting to reopen things, I wasn't excited. I wasn't excited to get back on the bike. I wasn't excited to dive into that community or those studios. There was something missing there. And then there were so many other factors with my family. You know, my dad was experiencing some really scary health stuff right at that moment. And my siblings are having kids and they've all since moved back to Maine. And I was feeling this deep pull to come back to my people. And I felt that throughout the years. So let's say from when I was 22 to 27, I think I moved back when I was 28, maybe. Um, throughout those years, I think I gained at least the confidence in myself to say, yeah, I could do that. I can open my own spot. Because I said that the moment I left the first studio, I was like, I'm going to open my own studio someday. I wrote it on a sticky note and my friend was with me and I remember it so vividly. And I was like, I'm going to open my own studio. And with that idea, I was like, I have no idea what to do. Like I have no resources. I don't know how to run a business. It's just a dream. So recognizing my number one important thing was if I'm going to pour myself out there and give who I am away, if I'm going to do that, I want it to be with the people that I love, people that I know, people that have impacted my life. Like 
one of my best friends, Crystal, like she was in class this morning and it's like, I get to share this moment with her knowing that she was a part of every step of the way. She was the one that was outside in the parking lot with me when I was bawling my eyes out when I walked out of the first studio because it was so hard. She was there in Nashville with me when I got the news I was accepted to SoulCycle. She was there when I had super problematic conversations with my landlord at the last space that had to be facilitated by someone because it was so aggressive. Like these really challenging points of shift and transition she's been a part of, but now she gets to enjoy this journey and how it's come to be. And my dad, he rides, he has over a hundred rides at my studio. Never did I ever expect he was the one in my family that was going to be showing up to say that my studio manager is my best friend and feels like a sister to me. Like that's what this is about. And it makes me emotional thinking about it. Cause I'm like, why would I just want to get up on a podium and give away to people who don't even know me, don't know my story, aren't connected to me in that way? That's what I feel like is powerful impact. And that's the magic of small communities is connecting with people that have also shown up for you too. Because this place is not just me. It started there, sure. But every step of the way, I had support in some form or another. And the moment people bought into that and bought into myself and what the vision was, is when it grew exponentially. And people have taken it, embodied it, and made it also their own, you know? And so that's why being back home was so important for me. And I realized that when COVID hit, I was like, this isn't right because I'm not looking forward to just, I'm not bought in anymore. That's the only way to say it. And recognizing the polls back home, I knew I needed to be near my family and to give back to the community that raised me. Coming up, how Katie, with no money and a lot of help, turned an illegal cycling studio into one of the area's top fitness brands. Stay with us. This is Seaco Stories. Hey, everyone. It's Troy. I just want to pause here for a moment and tell you why Katie's story resonates with me so much. You heard her say that she bounced around places like Seattle, Nashville, California, and that despite living in these wonderful places, she could never quite find the happiness she wanted. And it's because she didn't have a purpose in these places, and the people she cared about weren't around to share the experiences with her. I get what she means. Over the past few years, I've lived in some amazing places. I was in Boston, Denver, Phoenix, Honolulu, even London, and I've visited a million more. To the outside world, I was living my best life, but I didn't feel that way on the inside. And it's because I lacked the things that truly matter in this life. Strong relationships, feeling like you belong, like you're a part of something, and that you're making the world a better place. I couldn't find that feeling in any of these cool places, but I've got that now here on the seacoast. And that's why I started this podcast, to connect even deeper with this place that I now proudly call home. To help this show become something that every person on the seacoast can feel a part of, I just ask that you do me one favor. Send this episode to another seacoaster in your life, just one person. Because every time you do that, you bring the seacoast just a little bit closer together. And I think we need that more than ever. Thank you so much for doing that and for being here. I really appreciate it. Let's get back to Katie's story. So take me back to the origin story of this very studio that we are sitting in right now. You had written on a piece of paper years prior to that, that you wanted to open a studio. So what happened in in the in-between time to turn this dream into a reality? There was a pivotal moment that Crystal was a part of, um, of course. And when I came back home during COVID, I decided to visit. Um, I sat down with her and another girlfriend at the time. And we just had this realization, whether it was all a dream in that moment, it felt like an explosion of just like, yes, this is the time. This is what you're doing. And I'm very much someone who the moment I decide 
it is happening. <laughs> there is no turning back from that because it's just in my head. I'm like, okay, I'm going to open a studio. That means I got to move out. That means I have to give my two weeks. I have to move across the country again. And so we had this incredible conversation with all the right people saying, you can be the face of it. I'll be like HR and the management and like the behind the scenes person. And my other friend was like, yeah, and I know someone with capital. Like the whole dream came together in this moment. <laughs> What's so funny is literally none of that happened. Um, none of it. So I was able, though, to adapt and work with what I had, which was nothing. I had debt. That's all I had. But I had a dream. And I was like, again, I'm going to figure this out, whether it makes sense to me financially or not. I'm going to do it because I can't not do it. And I can't do a job that isn't fulfilling me in the ways that I want to be fulfilled. And so anyways, I found a job here as a health coach from like nine to five. And then I went back to the restaurant. I'd worked at many years in the past. So I had two jobs and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna teach virtually. I'll just use my parents' barn, which was a room above the garage on the property. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna turn this into my studio. I had one bike that was like this old rusty Schwinn I bought off of a Seco sports club for like a hundred bucks. Like it's hard for me to even transport myself to that moment because I had no part of a studio, but I was going to create that. And so I was like, okay, I went to Target and I bought black sheets that I like pinned up on the walls to black out the room, literally with tax. And then I got a computer or I had my old laptop. I got a GoPro to film the classes. And then I got on MindBody, which was a software I was familiar with, which is not what I use now. But at the time it was all I knew. So I, I got that going. I built a brand. I had a friend from SoulCycle that was also a graphic designer or brand designer. He helped me with my logo. That is still the same logo to this day. So grateful for him. He helped build out my website. So again, there was this, whether it felt comfortable or not, there was definitely some support happening in ways that were like helping me make this happen. Um, something as simple as my friend being like, yeah, I'll take care of that for you. I got you to a guy that I still to this day don't know how this happened. It's the craziest part, I think. And the whole reason I was able to start. I met a guy that was in Southern California that he actually still to this day customizes Stages bikes. So Stages is the brand of bikes that we use. They are one of the best bikes you can get for indoor cycling anyways, and most common in studios now that ride this way. Um, so I was dreaming about having a studio full of bikes that have my logo on them. I had a dream and I knew that he had done some studios locally. And so I reached out to him. I got him on the phone. I told him about my vision, my plan, everything I wanted. He's like, oh, cool, cool, cool. He was someone that, I don't know if you've met people like this. It's just the moment you talk to them, it's like you've been friends with them for like 30 years. You don't even know this person. He was just so comfortable to speak with and very supportive and positive and uplifting. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. This sounds great. How much, <laughs> how much for 50 bikes, you know, like it's so expensive, but I wanted to know the details. So then when I went back to California to like settle everything and move my stuff, I made a trip to LA to visit my friend and I asked him if I could swing by his shop. So I did and I met him in person. And then we talked more about what my plan was and my vision and all this stuff. I moved back home to the seacoast and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to start this up. And I was looping him into my progress. And he's like, look, you know what? Like, what if I just send you, I'll just send you five bikes and don't worry about it. Just get launched. I'll just ship them to you. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? Just send me five bikes. That's like 12 grand. I don't have that money. This conversation was just like, but I need it to be clear. I cannot pay you for these bikes, you know? And he's like, oh my gosh, no, like just get launched. Just do this. Don't worry about it. They showed up at my house on a freight truck. I didn't even pay for shipping. This guy sent me five bikes, brand new stages bikes to my home across the country. And I was like, wow, okay. So yeah, this is happening now. So now I have five bikes in my possession that are new. I didn't, got rid of the Schwinn, but I was like, I have these five bikes. I can work with this. Now I can have people in person and online. Cool. Let's do that. So then I turned the barn into more of a studio where I had four people in front of me and I had the screen. So we were live streaming and teaching in person. And it's a room that's half the size of this lobby. So I operated out of there very illegally. 
<laughs> for for 10 months. Because of COVID restrictions or because of- Because it was a house. Like I was running a business. I got nothing. Like if I actually went through coding and through the town okay. and approvals, like, no, I didn't do any of that. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to teach, but keep but it like on coming. the DL. Yeah, people were coming. So that was just, it was like a speakeasy version of a, of a <laughs> studio, it was like underground. Like you had to show up to my parents' house and get barked at by their dogs and like use their bathroom. Like this is crazy. You know, it's just crazy. But I did that and I was like, no, this is going to work. And then there's um, so many miracles that occurred, but I, I do want to call out the fact that when I was in California, I met someone there that worked at SoulCycle as a manager. His name was Chance. And him and I just got to know each other. I was only there for six months and I was at his studio even like less frequently, but he was so kind every time we engaged and he was so supportive of me as a new instructor. And so I sold him on this dream when I was there. I was like, yeah, I'm moving back home. I'm going to open my own studio and told him the whole plan that was not there, but it was in me. I was like, no, this is what's happening. And he's like, oh, I want to be a part of that. And he moved across country, literally in, I think I moved out back here in October of 2020, 2020, and he moved to Maine or New Hampshire to Portsmouth in January of 2021. He left his whole life to move to the seacoast to be a part of this studio that was actually just a barn in my parents' house. <laughs> What does this say about you that you have <laughs> this person changing his entire life to do that and also another person sending you $12,000 worth of bikes, no strings attached? I want to call out too, I have since paid for those bikes. So there was always a string. It was just at, not at that moment. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like that's a great question for me to think about actually. Is that scary? I don't know. <laughs> Is that a positive thing? I'm like, but I, uh, wow. I love that question. I really love that question. Um, I feel as though I can speak to this idea of leading with your heart and the impact that that can have on others around you when you're being not only, it's not like you have to just, I'm trying to think of, it's not just with anything like you can't just come up with some idea and be like, oh, this is an awesome idea and hope that people are bought into that. But I was so confident somewhere deep down within me that this was going to work and that this was happening. And maybe there's some sense in others that are like, oh, I see that. I want to support that. I want to be a part of that. I don't know if it's just a natural instinct to someone who's so passionate about something. Yeah. What was the vision exactly that you were selling all these people on? Just that I was going to open my own studio and it was going to be big and beautiful like a soul cycle would be. <laughs> like now that I know in hindsight, I'm like, yikes. Uh, no, but it was just building a community that people felt. It was really about that. It's the vibe of the community. It's that feeling that people have when they walk in that all people can feel welcome no matter where you come from. And this isn't a judgment. This isn't a place to just walk in to be judged by people. I really wanted it to be a space that felt safe for anyone to walk into and that they can discover what they need to discover within themselves at the right time. But this is a place to help push people along, you know, and move them forward. So how did Studio One make it out of the five bikes in the farm? There was a point in time where I was like, all right, you got to either shit or get off the pot. <laughs> and I, I say that because nothing about those 10 months was positive business growth. Let me tell you, like you can't run a business, even that small operating one where you can make money with four bikes. It's just not feasible. Even without rent, there's just so many costs that are kind of there that you don't recognize. And what ended up happening serendipitously. Um, and again, this kind of is my belief in the universe and its way of supporting you when you need it and giving you what you need when you need it. And that's always something I have to kind of fall back on and trust. And so when I was looking for a space, I knew that Dover, I had a pull and I can't explain what that was. I knew I didn't want to go to Portsmouth. I knew that that wasn't the vibe of my people. I think Kittery was in consideration, a little bit of a smaller town, but centrally located. So it could have been good. Looked at a couple locations there. Everything seemed so crazy expensive because I had no idea what money was and the amount that this was going to be to start, you know, so I was clueless. I was clueless. And um, when I got to Dover, there was just this moment 
I found a space. I was working with a friend of mine who's real estate in real estate. She was like, hey, I found this myself on online listing. I said, hey, can you look into this for me? What's the deal? And it was an old dance studio in Dover that had vacated. And so it already had rooms built out in it. And I was like, oh, this could be like workable. I don't have to build walls at least, you know, like I can make a studio out of anything as we know. And I will, I make a room work, you know, I don't need all 6,000 square feet, but that would be cool. So I found this space and I was like, I think this could be it, you know, after seeing many others prior. And I found out there was another studio in town that was looking to expand. And they were also looking at this space at the same exact time as me. They found out about me. I found out about them, but they actually reached out to me first on Instagram or something. We're like, hey, because they don't teach spin. They just teach bar and strength classes and yoga and like everything we don't do. And I was like, oh, my God, that would be kind of cool to just co-locate with someone else to cut so much of the cost and to have all of that shared space where that would be a great compliment because we're not competing. We're not doing the same thing. This would be a great compliment. We came to an agreement where I would be a subtenant because I was not ready to surrender my brand and to just be a part of them leading the cycle program. I needed to stay separate. And I knew that. Um, I was very strong headed about that. And I was like, no, no, no. Like I, I can't just be a part of you, but I will be myself as a subtenant as Studio One. So that's how I got an actual studio in Dover was because we were able to share that space, which cut down the cost for me. And then I had to get bikes now. I needed to have a room full of them, not just five. So again, that came with support, taking out a home equity loan. Uh, my parents taking out a home equity loan for me to buy everything I needed. Um, so it was on a whim, but it was like what I needed to do to get it done. And I was like, all right, we're piecing this together and it's low budget, but it's like, it doesn't matter. That's what I proved to myself in the barn was like, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Actually, at the end of the day, it's about the feeling that you have when you're in the room. So that studio space in Dover, the first one, it wasn't designed how I wanted it to be but it was what had to be for us to exist and to grow and to get our feet under us. So once we had a lot of bikes, that's when stuff just took off because we had this little baby launch pad from the barn, like little baby brand awareness for 10 months of like, this thing's happening. Now we can announce we're moving to Dover. Now we can say we're not brand new. We're doing this for real now. People are going to buy into it rather than going to my parents' house, you know? And so we had a really successful launch weekend where we had six sold out classes, like Saturday, Sunday, all the classes were sold out. And we were just so grateful that from day one, we were successful in that space. The moment we could expand, um, it took off and Dover was ready for it. Um, we're the first ones to bring this to people for the first time. So that's intimidating and that's scary. It's like a little bit fragile. So you have to kind of ease people into it. And that's what I think our brand does really well is it wraps your our arms around people. And it's like, no, 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 you can do this. Trust me. We got you, right? We got you. So it's getting people in for the first time. It's exposing it to people that maybe haven't worked out in 10 years or just had a baby or whatever that may be feeling scared. Right. And so they were ready and they felt the love of the passion that we had as instructors in our team, pouring ourselves into it and not for nothing. It's really talented instructors. Our team is so talented. So that helps. It's It's a higher level experience. I'm very curious about how you create a culture that you want, because on the one hand, there's several approaches you can take. On the one hand, you can take kind of the military drill sergeant type, which is be hard on people, force discipline on them. But if you follow them and they might hurt your feelings, but you'll get results, you'll get the results that you want because they're going to push you so hard. There's the other side of it, which is be really soft with people, be really loving with people, encouraging, positive. So it may be softer and might not push you to your max or to your absolute potential, but we all have egos. We all have feelings. Uh, we'll walk out of there feeling perhaps a bit happier, but maybe not as fit. So how do you, how do you strike the balance between being nice and loving to people so that they come back, but also helping them become the versions of, of themselves that they come here to become? I love this question. And I think that very much it all depends on what you value most. And if you're someone who's looking for results and you're looking for metrics, you're looking for, I want to die in this experience. I want to push myself to the max, right? That 
is a specific way of being taught. And that's not how I'm motivated. And that to me is defeating. And that's not the vibe that I want to put on someone who's trying to change their life and is scared. Like I feel like that person is needs help and needs support and encouragement. So I lean more towards the other way where it's like, no, you can you can decide what you want to take out of this. And because you're not ready for drill sergeant, if I was screaming in your face, you wouldn't come back. And what's the point in that? If someone's going to walk in the door, have this horrible experience or feel like they're defeated, they're not, not capable, not able to keep up. That's never the way I want someone to leave my space or my room, or I don't want to make someone feel that way. So there is this, yes, Leaving them to their own devices, of course, isn't the best answer either because it's like, no, we need to help hold each other accountable. Let's be real. But I think what I sway more that way because I want to welcome people in. And then as a community, what I think we're shifting into now and what I'm excited for is more ownership from all of us. Whether you're a rider or you're an instructor, we all have to be engaged. We all have to give to that space. We all have to give energy to it. We can't just sit there and be quiet and silent and scared. It's like, no, let's be free in here. But it's also like share each other's energy because that's when stuff changes. And I think so we've swung from this softer side to now taking step towards because we're a few years into this now where it's like, I think we're ready to be a little bit more confronting, a little bit more honest, a little bit more challenging in a way that's like, okay, let's get real with ourselves here. Are you going to wait for someone to do this for you? Or are you going to do it? Turn up your wheel, right? Like it's never going to be up to me. I can tell you all day that you're amazing and you're awesome, but unless you believe it, it doesn't matter. Unless you're physically doing the change and making the choice, it doesn't matter. So I think we have created an amazing place that welcomes people in, but we're also now moving towards this space that's more in the middle ground. Never will we ever be Joel Sargent. I will not allow that here. But I want people to feel like they can own it, too. And they don't have to be told, OK, she told me to do this. I'm, I'm going to do it now. It's like, no, I, I want to attack this. And I want to bring people with me. I want to be a leader, too. Whether you're a writer or an instructor, we're all doing the same thing. And I think what's most important is we're all human beings. We just heard my whole life story. And I no part of that was I like, I know exactly what I'm doing every step of the way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I'm sitting here right now, like with a very successful business and a team of people I love and a community that's amazing. And I have so much change coming to me. So I think what I envision for us is we've built this beautiful foundation that is a culture I'm so proud of, but it's now time for all of us to shift because as I grow, my impact changes too. Like as I'm digging into my own stuff, which as a leader, like I have to do that because I'm faced with mirrors all the time as you manage other people, as you put yourself in communities, like you're being challenged within yourself so much. And I feel and I believe that effective leaders are willing to do that work if they want to bring a community forward and they want to evolve, right? And not stay stagnant and stuck. Like we all have to continuously check ourselves. And so that's kind of where I'm at now of like, okay, my feet are planted in the ground. <laughs> like we have a home. That was a huge missing piece for us. So we can enjoy this, but now it's time to get real in ways that we couldn't before. And I think we've taken these people on this journey that have stayed with us it started off softer, but it's like we're all ready to keep to grow and to grow. You have to confront stuff. You have to challenge yourself. How are we going to do that? You know, and so it's our job now as instructors to be more intentional with our wording and a little more firm in the sense of like, I am going to act like your best friend and tell you what you need to hear, you know, <laughs> like that type of thing. I'm not going to yell at you and make you feel horrible about yourself ever, but we all have to own this now together. And, and that's kind of the direction I feel like we're heading in. We like to close out this podcast every week uh, with the same question. And I'm curious to hear your answer. What is your mission? My mission is to help people come back to themselves as I have had to do that with myself and continue to learn to do that throughout my life. And I think this is a vessel or this is one way that I can help people connect to themselves more. And this is where this journey is starting for me. Our branding is Studio One and it is We Are One. I think we are so much more connected than we ever feel like we are. And that 
building community is an opportunity for people to feel into that and feel the connection to others. And I think, though, it starts with someone who's willing to do the work on themselves and with their own heart. And how you show up for yourself is how you show up for everybody. I firmly believe that your impact um, that you have in your own life, right, like when you're willing to be vulnerable and work through stuff that you that's holding you back, right? It allows you to connect with people in new ways when we get out of our own way and just it comes back to being a human. But my purpose is to help people remember that they have so much more power than they think and that they aren't a victim to their environment all the time. It's like you can choose differently. You have the power to do that. And if you've never felt that power, I want you to feel it in that room for the first time. If you feel like you don't have control over your life, I want you to feel like you do in there. And that's the beginning of something. And that's starting the process of self-discovery. And that's only because I've had to come back to myself time and time and time again when I get overrun and overwhelmed. And when I struggle with depression, like in and out of these states, right? Like I always lose myself in those moments. And that's when it's when I find that again through different tools and things as I explore that, why that continues to happen, right? I have to keep doing the work. And the work is with me and it's not up to anyone else to decide how I feel or, or where I'm going. And that's scary sometimes because, yeah, you have all the accountability on yourself. But I think these communities in a place like this is here to support someone who's ready to, to make change. And I love seeing the benefits of someone's eyes like light up like I never thought in my life I would work out. And now I'm here six days a week. That to me is like mic drop. That's a different person. That's really where the impact is. And for a place like this, that happens time and time again. And so there's something magical about that. And I want to ride that and keep going because there's so many people out there that need this. And the ones that are ready will find it. I know that. And it feels so good, although we give so much on this end of things. It feels so good in return to know that I'm helping. And that to me is the impact I want to make. And that is exactly the kind of impact I know Katie is making on the Seacoast. A big thank you to her for joining me and for sharing her story. If you would like to become a part of the community that Katie is building, visit Studio One's website for more information, the link to which is in today's show notes. And good news, Studio One isn't just a cycling studio anymore. They now offer strength training, yoga, and more, just in case cycling isn't your thing. Now, before I left the Studio One lobby, I had to ask Katie one final, final question. As I said last week, I am obsessed with exercise. I make time for it every day, and I know a lot of people want to exercise but just cannot find the time to do it, and I totally get it. A lot of people, especially here on the Seacoast, are very busy and have lots of things going on, and so I understand that exercise can often be the first thing to go. But I wanted to ask Katie, if you're a very busy person, say a top executive or a working mother of two, how can you find 45 minutes for not necessarily a, a cycling class, but just any form of workout? And this is what Katie had to say. Where are you living your life for you at this point in time? Like, where is there time for yourself? It sounds like you're tied to every obligation that's outside of your own body. And that's where... That's why I love people who have crazy busy lives. They find time. And those people are like, I have to for my mental health. That's it. Like, I can't sacrifice that. And I think we're so good as humans to just put that on the back burner because it's not a concrete deliverable. It's not a metric. It's not a number. It's nothing I can record. It's like, no, I just feel better when I work out. And that's the first thing to go out the window when things get busy or we don't have as much money anymore. It's like your mental health goes away because you just survive. And I understand that. But I think someone that has zero time, all the intent in the world, in their mind, their heart's not ready, like to make that a priority. And so I'm not going to convince them to come. I would say we'd love to have you and we're, we'll be ready when you're ready. But I think your mental health is like number one important, the number one important thing and is something that I will not sacrifice. If I find an experience that makes my life better, I'm not going to live without that unless I absolutely don't have to. And so that's kind of where it's all about your priorities and what you value and what's most important to you. And I'm not going to convince people anymore. They need to do it on their own because that person who's choosing to be here really wants change in their life, whether they know it or not. Something called them in and they're ready for this. And so that's really where you see the magic happen. 
I love that answer, Katie. A big thanks to her for joining me today. And a big thanks to all of you for coming along for the ride. Get it? No? All right. Well, I'll stick to my day job. But seriously, thanks to those of you who have told me how much you're enjoying the show. I actually met a young man at a bar this week, and he told me he loves the pod and that he wants more episodes to binge on his long drives. Baby steps, but we'll get there. Enjoy the week, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the holiday on Thursday. I'm going on the Heritage Wednesday night for a sunset cruise, so if you see me out there, come up and say hi. I would love to hear your story. Until next Monday, everybody, live free or die.